Well, it's good to be in God's house this morning, isn't it? Well, for some of us it is. It is good to be in God's house. It's good to have so many visitors with us as, as well. I was going to say old visitors, but you know what I mean. People that we haven't seen for a little while, and other people who are, are new to us, and that's absolutely brilliant. So you're very welcome this morning in God's house, and we really want you to just join with us this morning and come and praise and worship with us together. The only announcement I've got for today is that tomorrow is Peter Dennis' funeral. It's at one o'clock at the crematorium, so uh, really pray for Denise and the family, that the Lord will just be really, really close to them at this, uh, at this time. So we're going you know, to ask the Lord to really bless them in a wonderful way. We're going to start with the song, and then when we sing the song, we'll take up the offering as well. Thanks, Ben.
today because of the close political ties between Russia and Belarus, and because today is Mothering Sunday, and my own mother was born just north of Minsk, which is the capital of Belarus, we are going to pray today for Belarus. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today we want to intercede for the nation and people of Belarus, one of the poorest countries in Europe by total wealth. We thank you that you have been at work there because we know you are always at work. Please open our eyes to see how you have been moving in this nation, which is sometimes called White Russia. We bring before you this landlocked country, mostly flat with many lakes, forests, and marshes, and located in Eastern Europe between Russia and Poland. We pray for the 10 million citizens of Belarus whose identity has been shaped by many sources. There are many who grew up hearing stories of the communist revolution in 1917 and the moment that their lands were incorporated into the Soviet Union. There are many more who lived through the Chernobyl nuclear accident in 1986, which, while having taken place in Ukraine, left much of southern Belarus contaminated with radioactive fallout. So we ask you for your mercy and your healing for the roughly two million people who were uprooted by the Chernobyl disaster, and for those who still suffer the results of radiation sickness. We pray for the economic welfare of the Belarusian people, as 80% of industry and 75% of the banking sector is state-owned, and everything is reliant on Russia. We pray for the president, Mr. Alexander Lukashenko, who has been in his position since 1994. Known as Europe's last dictator, Mr. Lukashenko has maintained and consolidated power through authoritarian methods. There are tight controls on speech, on the press, and on religion. We pray for the many Belarusians who protested the 2020 election, which they called a sham, and which brought Mr. Lukashenko a sixth term in office. The protesters experienced harsh reprisals afterwards by the regime, and this in turn brought condemnation and sanctions from much of the international community. We pray that corruption might be exposed and that injustice would be thwarted. We pray for hope and a brighter future for the people of Belarus. We intercede for the majority of Belarusians who belong to the Orthodox Church, and also for the large Catholic and non-religious segments. We pray for the Orthodox Church, which is very ritualistic and where there is high nominalism among those who do attend. Because religion was outlawed and oppressed during the Soviet era, persecutions of those who practice their faith continue. Pray against the 2002 law, which severely limits religious freedoms by outlawing worship meetings in homes, congregations of less than 20, new religious schools, and the circulation of religious literature not approved by the state. This law also hinders churches' ability to buy or rent land, so we pray that this law would be abolished in Jesus' name. We praise you that even in this hostile environment of persecution and want, more and more people claim to be followers of Jesus, and we praise you. I pray for my own extended family who live in Belarus, none of whom I have ever met, as my mother was taken from her home during the war when she was still single. May my unknown cousins, nephews, and nieces be presented with the gospel, and may they come to know and love and serve you with all their hearts. Yes. And finally, Lord, with joy we intercede on this Mother's Day for families that that know you, that love you, but who have been separated by war, by economic need, by civil service, or for any host of reasons, including missionary support. Holy Spirit, please comfort those mothers' hearts as they trust you for the welfare of their children and their grandchildren. Even here in our, in our own church, there are mothers from the Philippines, from Africa, from the Caribbean, including myself, whose loved ones are far away. 
Please, Lord Jesus, help us to lift our eyes to you, to recognize your goodness in the years gone by, in the present, and look to you for the fulfillment of the dreams and the hopes that we hold for those who we love, but we know you love even more. So, in the strong and name of Jesus, in whom we have our joy, amen. amen. There's a need, isn't there, to be passionate about the things of God. And Mother's Day is one of those days when it sort of brings a family together. And we want to thank God for every mother that is represented here. And the thing is, even though we're male, some of us, we still have a mother. And in, in expressing that, I just believe it's a really great time and the Lord wants us to be praying for mothers, praying for uh, ladies, praying for people who mean an awful lot to us. And so often it's, uh, it's easy to uh, just let things go. But you know, when you've got family all over the world and you can't see them, mind you, we can see them more now than we've ever been able to see them before. It is wonderful that the Lord can be with them and minister unto them. And I think we need to remember our families today in, in a real way. Families who don't know the Lord. And our desire, and I hope your desire, it's certainly my desire, that all my family come to know the Lord. All of them. Do you believe in the household salvation? Do you believe that the Lord says it's for the whole of your house? I love that scripture that says, as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. That's everybody within it. And in those days when that was said, it was also the fact that there were servants within that. So it's all of the household. And I want us as we go through the rest of the service and be together, just remind yourself of those people who are not close to the Lord. That the Lord wants to be close to them. And the Lord wants to minister to them in a real and a wonderful way today. Kathy's going to come and minister God's word to us now, please. Yes, good morning everyone. Today is indeed the day when we celebrate mothers, those who are alive and those whose memory are within our hearts. For those of us who remember our mother with treasured and cherished memories, we also know that others will not have a good memory of their own, or no memory at all in fact. I am not a mother, I have not physically given birth to a child, yet within my own family, be in France or in England, I am able to give love and be loved in return. And some ladies here present will also be in the same situation. They have not given birth physically, yet they are known for their wonderful and loving attitude to many of us, displaying the qualities and the love of a mother. My dear papa died last year, age 100. The endearing term by which he called me in the last two years of his life was little mother. So what goes round, comes round. And this morning we shall hear of Elizabeth, the wife of Zachariah, and the mother of John the Baptist. Her name means, God is my oath. But first, who wrote the story, and therefore history? Luke did, the only Gentile writer in the Bible. He wrote the Gospel which bears his name and the books of Acts. Many as a defense for the Apostle Paul while waiting for his trial in Rome. He was a doctor, a physician. The Apostle Paul refers to him, our dear Dr. Luke. He was a well-traveled man and a great companion of the Apostle Paul during the sea voyages in particular. And of course in Rome. He would have met John and Mary once they stayed in Ephesus. And from them, and especially in his case from Mary, would have obtained the most intimate details which she had treasured in her heart and was obviously 
willing to share with him. Luke was a man of great attention to details. As intricate description of many events, it is him who tells us that Peter's mother-in-law had a high fever and that baby Jesus was snugly wrapped in swaddling clothes and that the Sea of Galilee was in fact a lake. But how interesting that God chose a doctor to recount with utmost precision the very intimate details in the life of two very special women, Elizabeth and Mary. So, it all begins with a Jewish priest, Zachariah, who lived when Herod was king of Judea. Zachariah was a member of the priestly order of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zachariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was barren and now they were both very old. One day Zachariah was serving God in the temple for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary and burn incense in the Lord's presence. While the incense was being burnt, a great crowd stood outside praying. Zachariah was in the sanctuary when an angel of the Lord appeared, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zachariah was overwhelmed with fear, but the angel said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. For God has heard your prayer and your wife Elizabeth. You will bear a son, she will bear a son. And you are to name him John. That's strange. You will have great joy and gladness and many will rejoice with you at his birth. For it will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or hard liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will persuade many Israelites to turn to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah, the prophet of old. He will precede the coming of the Lord, preparing the people for his arrival. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will change disobedient minds to accept godly wisdom. Zachariah said to the angel, how can I know this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. And now, since you didn't believe what I said, you won't be able to speak until the child is born, for my words will certainly come true at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zachariah to come out, wondering why it was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gesture that he must have seen a vision in the temple sanctuary. He stayed at the temple until his term of service was over and then he returned home. Soon afterwards, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she explained. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. The culture of the day that a childless woman carried a shame, even a guilt, certainly a dishonor, and Elizabeth would have always felt awkward in company of other women, and in particular, as her husband was a priest in the temple. God has forsaken her, 
And Zachariah would also have felt the same shame and dishonor. Luke tells us that those were righteous in God's eyes and careful to obey all the Lord's commandment and regulations. They would have known the scriptures from an early age and would have been awaiting the coming of the Messiah as read from both prophets Isaiah and Malachi. Then as we shall see, Elizabeth is in fact the example that waiting on the Lord often brings unexpected blessings. Zachariah is in the sanctuary. Luke tells us that he and Elizabeth have the same ancestry. They are both descendants of the priestly line of Aaron, who was Moses' brother. It is his turn to officiate there, and he is doubly honored. 24 groups of priests twice a year are on duty in the temple serving and offering incense, which represent the prayers of the people by the golden altar just outside the Holy of Holies. Suddenly the angel Gabriel appears. Well, we know that he delivers the message. The Lord has heard your prayer. So we know and Zachariah also desperately wanted a son, and he is to name him John. And as we have heard, great things are prophesied over him. The child will have a significant role to play in God's plan of salvation, and it will be a joy and a delight, and will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even before his birth. Yet somehow Zachariah questioned the angel, and therefore loses his voice. After his service in the temple, Zachariah goes home from Jerusalem to the hill country where he lives. We are not told how he did communicate with Elizabeth, but she would have noticed that something very unusual had happened to him. And somehow, Elizabeth rejoices. She received the prophecy. How kind the Lord is! He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. And she goes into seclusion. Actually, the Greek word here says she goes into hiding. Well now, the doctor will certainly understand the miracle, even if doubtful, for it is a miracle. The sort of things that God delights in doing, bringing forth out of the impossible. And Luke would also have known how the body of a woman works, and that a woman past the childbearing age would not immediately know that she's pregnant. She would have to wait a few weeks, even months, for that confirmation. So he withdrew from normal life and waited, we are told, for five months. The time of seclusion would certainly have brought her revelation from the Holy Spirit, a deeper and profounder closeness with God. The situation needed to be fully understood, even if mysterious, and God wanted her to understand. So six months go by, and the pregnancy is well advanced, and she receives a visit from her cousin Mary. And she knows exactly that the Lord is sending her to spend time with her. Time which is to benefit both women. The angel Gabriel has told Mary of Elizabeth's situation, of course. And when she enters the room, there is a complete humility on Elizabeth's part. She does not concentrate on herself, but immediately proclaims, Blessed are you above all other women, and your child is blessed. What an honor that is, that the mother of my Lord should visit me. When you came in and greeted me, my baby jumped for joy. The instant I heard your voice, you are blessed, 
because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. And to confirm the prophecy of the angel Gabriel, the child in the womb leaped up so as to acknowledge the child in Mary's womb. This is a moment of intense beauty, of absolute wonder. Have you ever paused and reflected on this moment? Luke recalls it so well, but it is a moment encapsulated in the Bible. And Mary burst into the wonderful magnificent. We can only imagine what these two women would have done during their time together. They would have prayed, read the sacred scrolls, pondered upon the greatness and goodness of God to them, thankful and grateful, the old one to the young one, sharing the joy of expectancy, recognizing their role in God's purposes, and understanding something of the significance of the babies they were carrying. But also, they most probably would have been practical, talking about morning sickness, swollen ankles, and feeling tired, if not exhausted. Strange to think that. But it is very likely what they would have done. And Mary returns home, having found encouragement. Then it is time for Elizabeth to give birth to her baby. How would she have felt when she cradled the little one in her arms? The miracle had been performed. No longer a shame upon her, but a real blessing. She had given birth to someone who would have great significance among the Jewish people. Now everyone knew, the neighbors, the relatives, everyone was rejoicing with heart. And then it's Zachariah's turn now, for he speaks, Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited his people and redeemed them. He has sent a mighty saviour from the royal line of the servant David, just as he promised. Through his holy prophets, long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He had been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant with them the covenant he gave to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness forever. And turning to the little baby, Zachariah said, And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sin. Because of God's tender mercy, the light from heaven is about to break upon us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. And we are told that John, John the Baptist, grew up and became strong in spirit. Then he lived out in the wilderness until he became his ministry to Israel. What a legacy for a woman who waited so long to bear a child. And as a mother, Elizabeth would have been instrumental in teaching the little boy the child that she had given birth to in teaching the ways of God. Righteous and blameless, she would have been patient and kind with him, and he would have been taught 
to be careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations until his time came to go and start his ministry. And yes, Elizabeth is an example to us that waiting upon the Lord can bring wonderful blessings. And the miracle thus applies to each one of us also. That time when we surrendered our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and experienced the new birth. Some of us would exper experience it early, while for others, it would be towards the end of their lives. Certainly, that was the case for dear old Nicodemus. You see, the Lord Jesus is no man's debtor. To the workers in the vineyard, <coughs> he promised and delivered the same reward for their work. Those who came at nine o'clock received the reward. And those who worked all day received the reward. Those who came to the eleventh hour received the reward. God is good. God is good. And today as we remember mothers, we are grateful for our mothers, we are grateful for those in our lives who had motherly attitude towards us and help us in many different ways to understand the value of a mother. And God himself says, I am a mother to my people. And the Lord Jesus so desperately wanted to gather the people under his arms, like a mother hen gathers her cheeks and cries. But mothers are to be celebrated, and we thank God for mothers, and a closing prayer for mothers. Lord, we want to thank you for our mothers, those who are still alive, and those who have gone, for the input they have had in our lives over the years, the gentleness, the kindness, and the way they brought us up, the way they parted wisdom, insight in our life, the way they helped us in difficult circumstances and rejoiced with us in good times. And for those who have not had the love of a mother, we just pray this morning, dear Lord, that you will come and minister to them, that they will know your love that is so wonderful, that they will know your presence, dear Lord Jesus, that they will feel as you put your arm around them, that you love them as a mother loves her child. So bless all the mothers today, dear Lord, we pray, and help us to look up to you always, to reflect the very values of our Lord Jesus Christ, of his very character, and the loving God, our Father. Wherever we are, with whoever we are, in all circumstances, may the love of God shine through us, amongst us here today, uniting in his love and abroad, all around. May we be true witnesses of the love of Christ around. We thank you, dear Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Isn't it just wonderful that the Lord had a plan all the time and fulfilled every single day in every part that he is inclined towards them. I'd say I did smile when um, Catherine was reading one portion of scripture when it said and described um, Elizabeth as well alone in age. <laughs> now I tell you what I'd read to think part, that was the part of the reason why he was had his voice taken away. He would almost stepped the mark. But um, I don't think I'd get away with saying to uh, certain people who are here that she's getting well along in age. <laughs> but uh, but that's, that's the great thing, isn't it? God, that's what he wants to do. 
when he wants to do it, in the way he wants to do it, and it always causes his blessings, and it always causes his joy. I'm going to sing a song before we come around the communion table together as we worship the Lord. And remember, this was another promise that God gave his son. spoke a better word for Zechariah and Elizabeth. And you know, sometimes we believe what people tell us, but the word of the Lord is always a better word to fix our heart on. So your blood is healing every wound, and he's still doing it now, every single day, all around the world, whether it's Belarus, whether it's uh, the States, whether it's Ukraine, he's still healing wounds, both out and in. So let's sing your blood.
spoken over, spoke no better word over us. No better word was spoken over us than what we celebrate in this table. Than what he gave us when he died for us. For me, little old me. And the words that he speaks over our life, we need to learn to listen to what the scripture says. Believe what scripture says, not what everything else might tell you. Believe the better word of God. Thank you, Lord. such a change in our lives. So we're going to come around the table this morning and do what we always do. And we're going to come and we're going to examine our own hearts and lives before the Lord this morning. And ask the Lord to show us if there's something there that shouldn't be there. That we put it right. Because I love the fact he, say, he says that when you put it right with him, then you're in a position where you can come and partake. He's not banning you from the place. He's not banning you from this. He's saying, let's put it right. And then you enter in and have all that he has for us. So let's just pray. And let's have a few moments of self-examination. And thank God for what he's done. Because what he's done is enormous. For what he's done is wonderful. And for what he's done, it was for me. And you need to say the same. It was for you that he did it. <coughs> so we thank you, Father, that you speak a better name. You speak our name. You speak over us with love and with mercy and with grace. And Lord, as we come to this table this morning, Lord, it breaks our heart to realise what you did for us. But then there's a joy within us too, because without it, we wouldn't be where we are, and we wouldn't be the people that we are. We wouldn't be sons and daughters of the King of Kings if it hadn't been for you coming and dying and rising again and coming back one day that we will be with you forever. Lord, so as we partake this morning, bless it. Bless it as we partake of the bread and the wine, and we will give you all the praise and all the thanks and all the glory. Because you are the only one that deserves any of it. And we give you love. And we give you everything of ourselves. You might take it to you that's that sweet smelling. Save us more. Just ask the servers to come so they can assist us in serving communion this morning. Same night. 
moment when Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it and he said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. His body. No one else's. No one else's was good enough. But he came, his body broken and marred, for you and I this time. So let's just partake of the bread together. And there also he took, he took the cup. After something saying, he said, This is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you will claim and proclaim the Lord's death, but only until he comes. I don't have that assurance this morning that Jesus is coming again. More than that, he's coming for you. He's coming for me this morning. I want to thank him, the one whose blood was shed, the one that through his blood we have life and we have victory and we have that grace and glory that he bestows upon us. And even this day, we thank him for all that he's done. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
because you want to just join these lovely brothers and sisters, I get the pleasure of looking at all your faces. And it's such a joy because you're very special. We've got visitors, we've got people we know, and it's just special. But you love the presence of God. I just feel Holy Spirit, we just love it. You've said where two or three are gathered, you're present with us. And we love that, we love that. So Father, I just want to pray the truth of those words. We're going to sing them again into the hearts and lives of people this morning. If you feel that God is leading you to a scripture that you want to share, then please feel free to share. If you feel God has a word of encouragement for someone, if you know who it is, zip out of your seat, go find them and encourage them. Don't be rooted to the spot. If you have a word of encouragement for us as a church, then speak it out. We've spoken about it being a better word. Matchless love and beauty he shows us all the time. Is he the treasure of your heart? Do you want him to be the treasure of your heart? You can say, please, Lord, I'm not there yet, but I want you to be the treasure of my heart. Are you feeling weak this morning? Struggling? God is full of mercy. Mercy overcomes judgment. Do you remember we heard that as it was preached the other week? God's mercy is so much greater than any judgment. He's he redeemed your past. Have you let go of it? He's redeemed it, but you haven't let go of it. And your present wrong. Challenged us before we took communion to make sure we were right with God this morning. That's just such a, an easy thing, but such an important thing to do. So we're going to sing this again. And if you want to just stand and let the presence of God fill this place, that's perfectly right. But if you want to sing these words, if you want to move around, do so. Because our God is surely amazing. Thank you. 
you go to doing business this morning? Is it rough in this place? Just give God time. Just give the Holy Spirit time. But you know, there's one name that's above every other name. And at the name of Jesus, one day every knee will bow. But until that time, it's a powerful name. It's one that changes things. I just want to speak the name of Jesus.
Lord, we just want to pray for Denise and the family, as tomorrow is going to be a harrowing day for them. And Lord, we just thank you for you, the fact that you use Peter in so many ways. And Lord, we just ask you to be with them as a family, that we would be standing with them and declaring to them, you belong to the Lord, we belong to the Lord, so we are together in these things. Lord, just bless us as we go to our second home, we pray, and cause us to rejoice again in you. Bring it us back again, rejoicing on the things that you've done, where you've answered prayer, those prayers where we prayed about our families. You've answered them, Lord, and you've started to do a new work in them. And we give you praise. Amen. 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 Come and join with us for coffee and some, I think, some biscuits. So you're all right there, John. <coughs>